Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthland Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. This is part two of a message that I, I began earlier today. And the title of these two videos will be something along the lines of Why God Made Women Type in Shadow. So this is part two. If you haven't seen part two, it is linked in the description box below. And I urge you to watch th that part first so that you can get the entirety of this message. There's a lot of background in that video that will not be recovered in this video. So having laid a foundation that um, women were made for God's glory, and in the image of God, as men are, but also that women were most particularly made to be a picture of the church of Jesus Christ uh, or of God's people. So a woman in the way that she lives her life in a daily way is either going to be a picture of the church of Jesus Christ and the way she conducts herself, or she is going to be a picture of the whore of Babylon, which is the false church, the Antichrist system. And one of the things that distinguishes the bride of Christ with the whore of Babylon is the whore of Babylon has many false doctrines and wants things like political power and authority. She's a feminist to, to um, even look at the picture of the whore of Babylon because she's riding on the beast and she's uh, in control correct and the beast is a picture of world government so in revelation 17 as we read it in the previous video that the great whore that sits upon many waters she's riding the beast and the beast again is a picture of the authority of the earth the global world government so it's a global religious authority that has control of, of the government authority. And it's an inversion, of course. We're seeing a picture here of a woman who is in charge. In the previous video, I talked about how feminism and Marxism is satanic in that it turns upside down the beauty of God's creation in so many ways. But most particularly, it does this regarding marriage. So the feminist system says that the woman is actually more moral than the man because she's a mother often. But just by virtue of fe being female, she's just nicer. And, and men are, are evil and rank and controlling and, and domineering and so forth. And those of us who are born into this system we're kind of predisposed to feel resentful when we must learn to conduct ourselves according to what the Holy Scripture says about how women behave. There are many things these days that the false church teaches its people and particularly teaches women that are ver verily um, heresies that will lead many people to hell. One is, of course, that a woman can divorce her husband, which she can't. There's no example in the Bible whatsoever of a godly woman putting away her husband. There's no reason ever, even in serious, horrible cases of abuse, where before God you can get a divorce. You can get a civil divorce if you need to protect yourself. There's no law mandating that you stay with someone who's dangerous or abusive but you're not free to remarry. This is clearly written in scripture, and I'm just going to go over this for you briefly right now, um, because I know that a lot of people don't understand this. It's so very important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, and unto the married I command, not yet I, but the Lord, so this is a commandment of God, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So 
the false churches, though, because they, they're they like a whore, so they'll tell you anything you want to hear as long as you keep paying them. And, and that's what they're there for. They're there to flatter you, and they're there to get your money and to exalt themselves as religious authorities to deceive the people. It's the false religion. While claiming to be Christians, so they'll tell you things like, well, yes, a woman is bound by the law unto her husband for as long as he lives. But if he was unsaved, if he wasn't a Christian when you married him, he was dead. He was dead in his sins. So therefore, your marriage doesn't count. You see, this is the serpent talking. Adam and Eve were not Christians. And their marriage was a covenant, a blood covenant before God. There are many cases in the Bible where it speaks about people who were not godly people, and yet God honored their marriage. King Herod is one example of this. King Herod had taken his brother's wife, and John the Baptist told him that that was unlawful for him to do. In other words, Herod was in adultery with another man's wife, his brother's wife. And John the Baptist told Herod that. Now, Herod wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a godly person. He worshipped Ishtar. He celebrated the Easter festival. That's written in scripture. So we know he wasn't a Christian. And, of course, this woman was enraged by this, and she manipulated her husband into beheading John the Baptist. God's people don't twist the scripture. They don't change the word of God to make excuse for sin. And the way that we define sin, the, the Bible says that sin is a transgression against the law. And God's law regarding marriage is, is fundamental to the entire story of creation. It's part of how God made the world to be so that even little small things, like for example, your relationship with your husband, is a small little microcosm of the eternal things. So a woman, how she conducts herself, she was made to be by God who made her, either to be a picture of God's people or to be a picture of that other seed, the seed of the tares, the seed of the liar, the one who twists the word of God and tells people things like, oh, you don't really need to do anything. You just have to believe. There are things in the Bible, and uh, particularly in the Old Testament, but not only in the Old Testament, where the way people lived is a picture of something. And I want to go into this with you a little bit now. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And I want to begin in verse 1. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon, whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and a 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and of the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, I'm not going to read this whole story here, but I do want to point out here that I'm sharing this story from you, from the Bible for you, pardon me, my sisters, because I want you to understand that this is more, this is about more than just recognizing the godly behavior of Abigail. Now, Abigail was married to an ungodly man. And he, he was churlish and he was, um, what's it say here? He was evil in his doings. 
So women sometimes, especially, you know, these days, often are ungodly to such, uh, married to such an ungodly man. I do speak English. Let me slow down a little bit. So a woman can be married to an ungodly husband. And Abigail was a fair countenance and, and she had good understanding. Now, David asked her husband for something and actually he had done some very good things for her husband. And her husband refused to um, help David. And for that reason, David was very wroth and was about to go murder and, and kill all the men uh, not only this man, Nabal, but um, all the men in his household and his servants and so forth. And Abigail, when she heard of this, she she didn't ask her husband. She loaded up a bunch of uh, provisions and food, which is what David had asked for. And she she sent her servants before her. And then when she came to David, she bowed before him and she says, forgive me, let this reproach come upon me and please let, let me apologize. And here's this provision for you. And I, you know, when, uh, rather than go kill everybody, wouldn't it be better if God dealt with my husband? And when that happens, when God deals with my husband, I just ask that you remember me. So let's read of this part, because I want to show you that I'm not making this up. And verily, there are so many people who won't read the scripture for themselves. They want to pretend they understand the word of God and create all kinds of false doctrines, collect your money and exalt themselves as religious authority, but they don't even know what the scripture says. So um, she said um, in verse 31, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offensive heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, in other words, her husband, then remember thine handmaid. What I, I said here is that this is a picture of something, and I just want to read one more, uh, two more verses. Let's start in verse 39. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. He hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head, and David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take, to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on the face of the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because this is an important shadow. It's a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus Christ came for a holy bride, there wasn't a holy bride. Everyone was a sinner. The Jewish people were sinners. They were in, all involved in kinds of uh, false religion. And of course, the Gentiles were in false religion. In the time of the New Testament, when the New Covenant began at, on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit of God was poured out upon the disciples, at that time, there was a way made for a holy bride to, to come into being by anyone, Jew or Gentile, repenting and obeying the gospel. And it goes like this, repent every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
Under the new covenant, God has made a way for his people to be a holy bride. And under the law, this wasn't possible because the blood of sin and uh, of, of um, goats and, 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 and bulls doesn't remit sins. It, it might have been a picture of the remission of sins, but it really didn't take sins away. That's why they had to keep making sacrifices. But Jesus Christ died once for all of mankind's sin, that those who would believe on his name and obey his gospel could then be his holy bride. So Jesus Christ died for his bride. Now, the story of David and Abigail is that Abigail was married to an unrighteous man. And she didn't divorce him, of course, and go try to get David to be her husband while her husband was yet alive. Rather, she accepted responsibility and made amends for her husband's poor behavior. She intervened on his behalf and on the behalf of all the men in, in that household. And then she went back and spoke the truth to her husband. He died. He died. She told him what had happened and he died. Then she became David's wife. And when she did so, she said, she said, behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Let's go to John chapter 13 and um, let's begin in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with, with the towel wherewith he was girded. And um, I just want to read now verse 14, 13 and 14. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, so for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his, master, than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye, if ye do them. You see, Jesus Christ was the servant of his Father. And this is written throughout the scripture. He was not a co-equal deity. He was the servant of his Father. And Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve those around him. He ministered to people. He spent his life teaching them the, the word of God so that they could understand about the kingdom of heaven and what God expects from his people. He came as a servant and then just before he was crucified, he set forth an example to his disciples that they should do now as he had done for them, that they should wash one another's feet. So when Abigail says that she would be a servant unto his servants, unto David's servants, to wash their feet, this is a picture of Jesus Christ and the church. It's not the only one in the Bible, and I'm going to go to another one in just a moment. But let's read on here, um, and starting in verse 18. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted 
up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Here he is speaking about Judas. Now Judas was someone who was in the fold. He was in the little flock of Jesus Christ. He was a disciple, and yet he was a betrayer. And this is also what manifests in the Antichrist system. The Antichrist system, the whoring church, is a betrayer. And that we know from Scripture that the wheat and tares grow up together until the time of the end. So just because someone calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean that they are. The way that you can discern whether someone is a Christian is whether or not they are walking according to the Word of God. We can read of this. Let's go again now to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And please turn with me, my sisters, if you can. And let's read um, in verse 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We can see that the way that we become holy and without blemish is first to obey the gospel and then thereafter to be cleansed with the washing of water by the word. So true Christians hold themselves to the principles of Christian conduct and the commandments of Jesus Christ that are found in the scripture. God doesn't change. His word is everlasting. It's the same today, tomorrow, and forever. When we read in the Holy Word in this time about the roles of men and women, these things are still true. And while when we're in heaven, there will not be male nor female, there will not be any marriage in heaven, presently there is. And while we are yet in flesh and men and women are very different, it's not just their sexual organs, it's their temperaments. Women were made to be followers, as the church was made to be disciples. Disciples of Jesus Christ follow Jesus Christ. They consider him Lord. And Abigail, before Nabal died, considered Nabal to be her Lord. And we just read that. We also read then that after he died, she had a new Lord. And this was David. And she bowed before him and said that she wanted to be a servant and wash the feet of his servants. A servant unto David by washing the feet of his servants. This is how women picture the church by our conduct. That when we serve a husband, the whole world can see what the church ought to be. And verily, that is why Satan has been so set against it and so purposeful in destroying not only marriage, but people's perception of what a godly woman is. So these days in the false church, women are exalted as pastors and preachers over a flock. They're doing so with their hair shorn off, with their head uncovered. They are usurping authority over their own husbands. They're speaking brazenly and loudly in the churches. They're standing up on a podium in front of everybody, dancing around uncovered, often in men's clothing, leading worship teams, leading Sunday schools, leading women's ministries, and so on. And none of this, I mean, a woman can be an and uh, as an elder sister to other sisters, but that is not done from a stage, my sisters. That is done 
as a back and forth uh, as a as an older sister, not as a religious authority. So these days, women think that all these things are godly behavior, and, and that's not true. These are false doctrines that belong to the whore of Babylon. When we want to tell the difference then between a Christian and someone who's of the false church, we can compare the difference between a woman who behaves like a godly woman and a woman who behaves like a prostitute, who, who has uh, jewelry hanging from her flesh, who is all decked out in uh, a red dress and, and taking authority over men, you see, the great whore of Babylon is pictured by a woman who does not hold to the word of God. And the way that we are washed, the way that we are washed is when we become a Christian, we then hold ourselves to the principles contained in scripture. You see, a woman doesn't have to be, and certainly no woman is, holy from the time of her birth. I want to turn now to to Luke chapter 7 and I want to read starting at verse 36 or 37 and behold a woman was in the city and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at me in, Fer in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster box of ointment so this, there's a woman which was a sinner and she heard that Jesus was in the house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. You see, this, this woman, her name was Mary. She was the sister of Martha, which is found in other parts of the scripture that tell this story. That Mary, who was the sister of Martha and of Lazarus, who had been resurrected from the dead. And this woman was a sinner. That she anointed Jesus Christ with uh, precious ointment with a sweet fragrance, and she washed his feet with her tears. This woman also is a picture of the church of Jesus Christ, because before we were redeemed and washed in the blood of the Lamb by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and receive the Holy Ghost, before that happened, we were all sinners and going to hell and our lord our savior bought us back he gave his own life to buy us back to redeem us from our sin and mary knew this she knew this because she had seen the lord jesus christ call back her brother from the dead and she loved Jesus. Now let's read a little bit more here. Um, and I'm going to skip over a little bit here, but Simon, and verily, if you read the other passages about this, all of the disciples and Judas, all of them took issue with this woman doing this. And the reason why they did was because they either thought the money for the precious ointment should have been given to the poor, or they thought this woman is a sinner and he wouldn't let her do this if he was truly a prophet. Let's read here. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Mine head with oil didst not 
my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You see, the bride of Christ loves Jesus Christ, and we know what he did for us. And if he tells us that he wants to be a servant, if Jesus Christ commands in Scripture, that a woman was made to be an help meet a suitable servant to her husband, then we're delighted to do so. If Jesus Christ tells us that we don't put on what pertains to a man, not only do we not wear pants, but we don't put on a man's role either. We don't try to be a shepherd of the flock. We don't try to be an evangelist or an apostle, which are all roles ordained to men. Rather, as women, we conduct ourselves the way the scripture commands a godly woman to conduct ourselves. We cover our heads. We dress modestly. We don't tempt men to commit adultery with us in their heart because we're wearing sexy clothes or because our hair is all out for everyone to, to uh, lust about. We conduct ourselves with grace and humility, happy to be in the role that God made us to be in. And verily, a woman who knows this has good understanding, as Abigail did, as Abigail did. You see, when a woman knows what she was made to be and isn't in rebellion against it, then her, her husband is delighted with her. Her children are verily blessed. And all who look upon her praise her for her works. But I want to close now with Proverbs 31. And Proverbs 31 is uh, goes into detail about what it is to be a godly woman. It is also a picture of the church of Jesus Christ and how beautiful the church is. So if you feel like reading it, and I urge you to, you can read it both in the light of this is what God would want me as a Christian woman to be like. And this is also a picture of Jesus Christ's church, of the bride of Christ. So let's read up uh, here in uh, verse, verses 29 through 31. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. I pray this message has been a blessing to you, my sisters. And, and please know that my email is always in the description box below. There's a little box in the description box that if you click on it, it says, show more click on that the entire description box will open up and in it will be all the the scriptures that i made reference to in the video as well as my email so if you want to contact me privately i i would welcome that or you can comment in the comment section below um, may the word of god go forth today and bless many in jesus precious and holy name amen